You're listening to Boomers Today with your host, Frank Sampson. Well, welcome to Boomers Today. I'm your host, Frank Sampson. Of course, each week we bring you important, useful information on issues facing baby boomers, their parents, and other loved ones. And I just want to thank everybody uh, for uh, listening to our show and for sharing our some of our shows with uh, family and friends. Our uh, our list is growing each and every day. Of course, uh, we're in, in addition to being on on uh, various uh, radio stations throughout the country. Of course, our podcast is on uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. And, uh, of course, uh, many of you listen to the show by downloading our free app, just if you have an Android or uh, Apple phone. Uh, just uh, go into your apps, type in Boomers Today. There we are, downloaded for free. And uh, when you're going on your walks or runs in the morning, uh, great some great shows and um we we our listeners are growing because we uh have such wonderful guests and i'm really excited about uh, today's guest uh who i've known for quite some time and and have worked with and have great respect for her name is kelly o'connor kelly is a elder care consultant and started a senior care authority franchise in the denver area and has become known in the area as senior care kelly Prior to that, Kelly cared for older and ailing family members and was responsible for making critical health care and estate decisions during a time of crisis. She then dedicated her life to supporting families throughout the elder care journey. She worked in almost every area of the senior care field, independent living, assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, hospice, and home care prior to starting Senior Care Authority in, in 2015. So Kelly, it's just a, a pleasure to have you on uh, Boomers today. Thanks for joining me. Well, thank you so much, Frank. I've been watching, uh, listening to Boomers today for so long now, and now I get to actually talk with you and talk with all of your listeners. Yeah, no, it's great. And we're talking, we're going to be talking about a, such an important subject matter today that I think people don't quite understand and maybe don't take real serious. Uh, I think after our discussion today, everybody's going to take it a lot more seriously. And that's uh, talking about power of attorney, uh, which in my opinion is uh, just a lousy name, but that's the name that's been given to it. But maybe you could explain uh, just basics here. What is a power of attorney, sometimes known as a POA? Uh, Explain what it is. So most people think a power of attorney is a person, and that is the first misconception. A power of attorney is actually a document, and the person who is serving as power of attorney is called the agent. And so what a power of attorney is, there's several different kinds. Uh, The two most common types are one is a healthcare power of attorney, a medical power of attorney, and the other one is a financial power of attorney. And so this is a document that designates the person who would be making decisions for you if you were unable to make them for themselves, uh, for yourself. And so I think that's the most important thing. It's a document, it's a legal document, and it's really critical because you are identifying the person. If you are not able or available to make decisions for yourself, this is the person that would be making decisions on behalf of your interests. So you mentioned something really important. I might not be quoting you exactly, but a power attorney is only utilized if that person needs someone to either make those types of decisions for them because maybe they are incapable of, they're in a, a particular situation where they can't make those decisions so what do you say to somebody who says, I don't need a power attorney, I'm just fine? What do you, what do you say to that person? Well, under the law, you have to be just fine in order to sign the document. So right, that, right. Is, you know, that, that, that is really important that you're just fine. 
But what a lot of people think is that when they sign that document, that they are giving away all of their authority to make decisions for themselves. And that is not accurate. And this is why it's really important to consult an elder law attorney or an estate planning attorney to help you set this up correctly. Because some of the power of attorney documents are in effect upon signature, and then others have springing criteria. So there are things that need to be met in order for that document then to be in effect. One of those would be uh, in capacity. So what we see is a lot of times, um, you know, for any of us, if we're going to the hospital and having surgery and we're under anesthesia, and then something were to go wrong in the surgery, or there would need to be a medical decision being made in, um, uh, while we're under, then there needs to be someone designated to make that decision, who knows what your wishes are, who knows what you would want in that situation, and then also has the confidence to be able to make that decision for you. And so it's a really, really important piece. And none of us know if there would be any kind of tragedy that were ha would happen. And some people think that it's that you only need to do powers of attorney when you are old. And a lot of people will recommend that anyone 18 years and older have power of attorney documents in place. So it's not about getting old. I think some people are afraid that if I sign it, it means my family will think I'm getting old and I shouldn't be <laughs> signing these documents um, because then something will happen to me, more of a superstitious approach. And then other people just don't want to give away their authority. And it doesn't do that if you have a good attorney looking out for your best interest. A great, great point. So, uh, you know, I have said, I don't know if you agree with this, that if someone turns 18 years of age, they should have a power of attorney. W would you agree with that? That uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that you don't, don't wait till you're going into surgery uh, before you do it, you know, because you never know what tomorrow will bring. And there's a lot of uh, uh, stories that, uh, that we could probably refresh people's memory of, of people who, you know, where the families were not agreeing on what should happen and there was no power of attorney. So is that what you advise to your families that you work with? Oh, absolutely. And especially if um, a child is going off to college or they're going to be, you know, living in a different part of the country, for that person to be able to designate the the uh, the child, the 18-year-old or 19-year-old, to be able to designate who they would want to make decisions, because a lot of times in blended families, um, you know, not not everyone's on the same page, and uh, also they might want a sibling to make a different decision, because many families have different values, either different political beliefs or religious beliefs, and so it may not be the power of the parent that they are aligned with, they might want a sibling to make those decisions. And so it's really important that uh, we designate the person who we trust the most to be able to look out for our best interest if we're unable to do so. So does someone need to have an attorney to set up a power of attorney? You, uh, you don't. There's actually some templated forms online. Uh, there are companies like LegalZoom that do have, uh, you know, forms that you can fill out. Um, so there are some very simple ways of doing that. Um, and so I always encourage people to look through, look at different ones. There's not a standard across the nation of what it looks like. Here in Colorado, we did have... Um, the Bar Association put together a template. So we do have a state template here in Colorado. That's not true with all of the different states, um, but there is one that families can use really quickly if they need to do that. I think the only time that you actually need an attorney to do it, um, some people just prefer to have an attorney look over a document, um, but if there is any specific uh, instructions that you're wanting someone to carry out, that would need to be a customized document specifically to your wishes. And so that's really when you'll get the biggest uh, value uh, out of investing in an attorney. Yeah. And I, you know, I've seen situations, I don't know if you have, where someone used a template 
then they they go into the bank <clears throat> to you know doing it you know uh, properly but they go to the bank to try to you know either move money uh, that maybe would be under dad's name and they go in with their power of attorney and the bank says no this isn't done correctly and they couldn't do it all right yeah so you know i think people i think you would agree should be careful you know with that it's probably like you say probably worth the investment uh of, of getting having an attorney elder law attorney that um uh can do it in the right way you know so uh do, do, now elder law attorneys that's something you could help people with uh, i know you're not an attorney but you you could put them in the uh, point them in the right direction with the proper people that do this Oh, absolutely. We have some amazing people that I've worked with for years uh, that really care about uh, doing a good job. And it's interesting, growing up, I always heard these negative things about attorneys. I think they sort of get a bad rap, but in the elder care and estate planning world, I've met amazing people that are truly amazing attorneys that are really advocating uh, for their clients' best interest. We, we have some great people here in Colorado. And it's the same with, you know, anyone that has uh, that wants a referral in their state. Frank, I know that you have a great team that you've put together across the country that can help people refer um, to uh, estate planning attorneys and elder law attorneys that they trust. Right, right. Actually, there's a, you know, there's websites out there, but uh, they could, you know, certainly people listening can, we'll, we'll, we'll share your contact information and they could reach out to you for it. Um, so, what would you say are maybe some of the um, mistakes or maybe just advice you could give? Like who, who do you, who should you select as your power of attorney? Should it be a family member? Should it be your best friend? Should it be who, who should it be? And what are maybe some of the mistakes people make when choosing a POA? This is such a great question. It is, what I see with my clients is usually it is the eldest son who is the financial power of attorney and the eldest daughter who is the medical power of attorney. And I'm not suggesting that at all. Right, <laughs> I'm actually suggesting common. something. Right. Con yes, yeah. I'm actually suggesting something different. And that is that you look in your life and you choose your uh, agent according to skill set versus favoritism. So just because you like someone, you know, we, we all have a favorite relative or a couple favorite relatives, but um, really look at their skill set and can they make a tough decision for you on your behalf with your best interest in mind? And do they have the skill set to carry out the duties that will be asked of them? So one example is the financial power of attorney. It's not someone who writes checks. Yes, they will, they, you know, they may be writing checks for you, but they have to understand very complex uh, conversations like how to navigate um, the insurance system. If someone is low income and might need to uh, go onto the Medicaid program, are they able to understand um, all of those documents and concepts? Do they have a 401k themselves and do they know how that works and will they be able to talk to the financial planner in an educated and informed way to be able to move money so that you are able to get the best interest do they understand real estate transactions and would they be able to make those kind of decisions for you so it's really i encourage people to do it skill-based uh, especially on the financial side and then when it comes to the medical side, um, it's really looking at someone also who has the ability to understand diagnoses and medications and side effects and, um, and all the technical medical things that are involved in providing care for someone. And I always think, you know, yes, they can say, 
um, you know, I don't want to have CPR, or yes, I do want to have CPR. But if there's some really complex medical decisions that need to be made, and if I need someone to take me to and from the doctor's office and communicate and get documents back and forth, who has the skills to do that? And I also encourage for the medical power of attorney to be someone local so that if they need to do, do anything for you, uh, the financial power of attorney can be done more easily long distance, but that medical power of attorney really has to make some decisions and does um, a lot of legwork in getting some of my older clients to and from the doctors. All right. Are there pluses and minuses of having one person be both? It almost, you know, initially I think it seems like, well, maybe it's just easier. I'm going to have my sister be my financial and medical power attorney. What, what's the, are there negatives to doing something like that? So it's a lot of work to be an agent for someone under power of attorney. Very, very, it's a lot of work. It can be. And so I also look at what is their workload? Just because someone has the skills to be the financial power of attorney, do they have the time to be that? And um, so some people, you know, only have one relative or one friend that they would ask to serve in that capacity. And that's fine, too. But if there are, um, you know, multiple people that would be involved in your care, it might be nice to spread the workload a little bit um, for people. And then... Um, one thing that's really important is your medical power of attorney obviously will be making medical decisions for you, but the financial power of attorney will need to pay for that. So those two individuals need to have a good working relationship or have very specific directions from you in how they should interact with each other. I had a situation very recently where the medical power of attorney was saying to um, uh, the financial power of attorney, uh, I want my mom to have 24-hour home care. And the financial power of attorney was saying, I'm only going to pay $15 an hour. Well, the going rate for home care is much higher than that. And in some cases, it could be double. It could be $30 or more an hour. Mm -hmm. So how is the medical power of attorney supposed to advocate on a medical side for a person if the financial power of attorney won't pay for it? Right. So those two individuals need to be able to have a great working relationship. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. So uh, I've got more questions for you, but I, I want to make sure we, we don't run short of time for you to share with everybody uh, just your information, commercial time, you know, I mean, go ahead, tell people, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, tell people how they could get a hold of you and uh, whatever information you'd like to share, Kelly. Oh, absolutely. Well, I am based here in Denver, but I do have clients all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, my phone number is 720-500-2550. And my email address is kelly at seniorcareauthority.com. Great. And I know, of course, you're part of uh, the Senior Care Authority network around the country. So uh, even if uh, somebody isn't in the Denver area, uh, they could call you and you could put them in touch with the right people, right? Oh, absolutely. We work together all the time. We have amazing people throughout the country and we are supporting people uh, all over and working together. And in fact, we get together every week as a team to see how we can um, support each other and support our clients better. Great. Great. So I'm going to ask you now about the, um, the, uh, the power of attorney on the other end of it. Okay. So somebody gets uh, asked by uh, whether it's family or friend, if they would be their power of attorney um, which is, you know, I guess an honor that they're asking, but like you said, it's a lot of work. Uh, so what are some of the challenges that POA, that particular POA would face? And sh is it possible that some should consider not accepting the role? That is such a great question because so many people you, they take it as an honor to be asked because obviously someone trusts you enough um, to be asked. 
but do they have the time and ability to be able to serve in that capacity? What I always recommend is that people have two and maybe three people in succession on who would be um, their agent. Because if one person is unwilling or unable to serve in that capacity, then it would just roll to the second person or the third person if need be. I think of this for a lot of my um, family members who have young children. And, you know, if they have three teenagers and they're trying to work their job, shuffle teenagers to and from all of their extracurricular and social activities, and then all of a sudden uh, their person has a healthcare crisis, how are they supposed to manage um, all of that at the same time? And so I also have some of my older clients that are in their well into their 90s, their children are in their 70s. And so I have in one family, there's three children, and two of the children have significant health care issues in addition to their 90-something-year-old parent. And so that's also something really important to, to look at and to see if your health is compromised in any way or your time is compromised in any way. You might want to encourage your person to go back to the attorney and to make another designation if you don't feel that you could successfully serve in that in that role for them. That's that's a that's a good point. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, okay? So, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, and I, I got stories too, so I got you covered. But um, and and I guess I would like to maybe share stories with our listeners to make them realize that this is something so important. Uh, but any. Yeah, of course, without mentioning people's names, but any uh, experiences you've had where someone did not have a power of attorney and it was a nightmare story because of that? Anything you could oh, think Oh, we of? have this. Oh, absolutely. This happens yeah. all the time. We have, there are so many clients that I meet that are um, in their 90s and they don't have powers of attorney. And so when it, when they do not have anything set up, then it actually goes uh, to the state here in Colorado. They do a medical proxy where uh, basically the hospital would say, who is interested in this person? And everyone would come together and um, there would be someone designated, you know, to make that decision uh, by proxy. But there is no legal uh, legal relationship at all. And that gets really expensive because you have to go and get guardianship. This happens a lot with my folks with dementia. So as soon, I recommend for anyone out there that as soon as there is a dementia diagnosis, that they go immediately from the doctor's office, if they can, to the uh, a state planning attorney or to the elder law attorney as soon as they possibly can get an appointment so that person can advocate for, for themselves. Just because someone has a um, dementia diagnosis does not mean they have, um, they don't have capacity to make legal decisions for themselves, but their wishes need to be immediately documented. And I run into that all the time that people have had a dementia diagnosis for years and there's no legal authority um, to act on that person's behalf. It's critical, um, especially in that situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I the, the one thing you don't want to have to do is have a complete stranger be making major decisions for your parent or other loved one. I mean, the fact is, is that even if, the family members are in communication and uh, there's good relationships. If there's no POA, guess what? <laughs> You're going to have a third party making those decisions. So it's so important, you know, it really. Is. And it's expensive too. That's what I tell my family. Oh yeah. If yeah. you have, if, if you want your money to be used for your care or you want to pass it on to any heirs or donate to charity, and you don't have these documentation, these documents in place, and you have to go through the uh, the state and go through either conservatorship or guardianship. That's extremely expensive. So it also makes financial sense to to do this as well. 
Yeah. You know, and I have found probably the number one reason why someone did not have a power of attorney is they assume that their spouse was automatically their power of attorney. And that's not the case, is it? It's not at all. They're just a next of kin. Right. Right. So they still, if if the power of attorney is going to be the spouse, they still have to do the same paperwork. Right. Absolutely. And, and also the tough part is with spouses as, um, as they age, if there is only the spouse listed on the power of attorney document and the spouse is the first one to become sick, then, and there's no secondary or no third person on that document, it's, it's essentially like having no document at all. Right. So it's really important to have the surrogate listed um, and one or two if you can. Yeah, yeah, great. So tell us a little bit about, uh, I know you want to talk about National Health Care Decision Day. Talk to us a little bit about, about that. So this is one of my favorite topics. I'm so grateful that you asked about it. So we've all heard the phrase that nothing is certain except for death and taxes, right? Right, right. (laughs) And so so there was a group that um, put together National Healthcare Decisions Day. And it's actually the day after tax day. So we file our taxes on April 15th and April 16th. Every year is National Healthcare Decisions Day. And I'm the founder of National Healthcare Decisions Day here in Colorado. And we have a national organization where we all work together. And what we do is we encourage everyone to look at their healthcare decisions documents. So look at their powers of attorney documents, look at their living will, look at all of their estate documents, look at beneficiary statements on, um, I I can tell a great story about that, but look at your beneficiary statements on your retirement accounts and all of your life insurance policies to make sure the person is still living, to make sure the person is still in your life. I had an ex-wife inherit $300,000 and um, that was not what the gentleman would have intended, but he did not change his uh, beneficiary statements. So we encourage everyone the day after tax day to be able to look through all of their documents and make sure they are reflective of their current wishes. The decisions that we may make as a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old, and a 50-year-old may be very different than those we would make at 70, 80, and 90. So we just encourage people just as a routine to look over those documents and make sure that everyone is still in place and these are what your decisions would be. Great. Great. So we've got a couple minutes left, Kelly. So uh, what would be kind of your wish uh, that people would just know what to do, what every power of attorney should know, just any advice that you could give to uh, those listeners who are going, yeah, you know what, I, I need to move forward, or I just became a power of attorney, and these are maybe some of the things I need to know. So any, any just general advice you could give would be great. I think the best advice that I can share is to get involved, get involved early and start to have some open conversations about money and about health care and about someone's uh, uh, end of life wishes and also their elder care wishes. You know, there's this beautiful and really sacred period of time, which is the last sort of one to three years of life. And what would they want? And to start to have those kind of conversations. You know, we, none of us ever want to think about dying um, and none of us ever want to think about being sick. But the earlier that we can have those conversations, the more empowered the uh, agent under power of attorney will be and the more comfortable they will be because so many times I get called into a hospital or into a rehab center and I'm having to get someone really up to speed just with the basics on what is Medicare and what does Medicare cover? It's health insurance. It doesn't cover assisted living or anything like that. Just the basics to try to ease people into the conversation and you can slowly and gently have those over time. And that National Healthcare Decisions Day on April 16th is a great way to every year just start to have a conversation to slowly engage people um, in the process of being able to support you 
just as you intended. And I, you deserve that. That's the most important thing is we deserve to have our wishes carried out throughout every day of our life. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, I could talk to you for, for a while longer, but unfortunately we're kind of out of time here, but uh, I'd, I'd like you to share with everybody again. I know you mentioned it before, but just in case they missed it, you know, how, how would the, how would, people get a hold of you, uh, either email, uh, web address, why don't you just uh, uh, mention that again? Oh, sure. Just give us a call. Um, my phone number is 720-500-2550. Um, I'll repeat that again, but it's 720-500-2550. My email address is really simple. It's kelly at seniorcareauthority.com. Senior Care Authority is all spelled out. And then my website is SeniorCareAuthority.com slash Denver Metro. Great. Kelly O'Connor, Senior Care Authority, Senior Care Kelly, thank you for joining us on uh, Boomers today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Frank. It was such an honor. And thank you, everybody. Just be safe out there and talk to you all soon. You've been listening to Boomers Today with Frank Sampson. To learn more about today's show, visit BoomersTodayRadio.com and join us next time for another edition of Boomers Today.